Halloween 2020, I had the privilege of sitting down with writer and filmmaker Wes Hurley. Join us in our first e-meet conversation about film, our wheelhouse of creativity, and mental health with only five days left to the 2020 election. You're watching The Kelly Mo Show. Yes! Woo! <laughs> Hi! Good! Nice to e-meet you. Nice to digitally meet you, finally. Yes. Yes, how, how long have I been chatting online? I feel like it's been... I think... I had found you in a YouTube rabbit hole. I found Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. And I, I looked you up, I think, on Facebook, if I'm not mistaken. It's definitely after MySpace. <laughs> so I think I, yeah. I saw you on Facebook and then we chatted a little bit about maybe collaborating, like if you ever needed music, which still stands if you ever need music. I, mean, yeah, no, I love your music, I do. Thank you. That's that's a huge compliment, and I'm a huge fan. We'll get into all that. And I also see your Capitol Hill photo, or excuse me, yeah. the <laughs> is that for sale? I want one of those. <laughs> yeah, I can send you one. Seriously, I'll send you one. Yeah, that's amazing. So um, <laughs> I'm gonna just go over some brief stuff. This is new for me, so um, you're my second interview. So bear with me. We'll get through it. It's supposed to be a fun. Do you want it to be horizontal? It's up to you. I can work with either. Yeah. Okay. You're the director, so you decide. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so, fun fact. Did you know we have the same exact birthday, May 25th? Yes, I remember that. Yeah. Uh, that's great. That's great. Okay. How are you doing? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm anxious about the election, but otherwise I'm great. You know? I <laughs> think everybody's in their place. It's like the scariest Halloween ever, right? <laughs> right? Maybe we can yeah. use the thin veil between uh, the real world and the spiritual world to have some incantation, some some manifestation of, of a shift that we need to, to feel safer. Yes. Yes. Also, upon researching you, another fun fact I stumbled upon is that in an article you were talking about driving from Texas to Portland because you're not into the flying thing. I'm yeah. into the <laughs> so I love that about you. Ah, uh, yeah. I, I prefer to go by ground. I know it like may prevent opportunities in the future. I've flown a couple times and I'm I'm good on all that. Are you um Are you right now in Portland? Or are you in LA? Where are you? Yes, I'm in Portland. I came back from SoCal, um, and I was actually visiting Arizona before all this COVID chaos. So I've been really lucky. Um, to have a safe place to be with roommates that care about each other and um, been laying low. Um, I've taken some road trips. I know that's maybe not the most smart decision, but um, travel as safe as I can, you know. How are you? Are you traveling safely? I mean, yeah, I haven't really traveled just because I, um, you know, I, I just finished my second feature film. So we, we finished shooting, we were super lucky, we finished shooting right before COVID. And so since then I've been in the editing tunnel, just like doing my own thing editing. So I haven't had a really reasons to travel. Yeah. But I mean, it kind of timing wise, it worked out because, you know, nothing like quarantine to force you to like <laughs> work on your own shit. <laughs> right? Like creative and internal. Yeah, it's like, yeah, you're not going to hang out with friends. <laughs> That's yeah. for sure. And is this the feature film we're talking about? You sent me a link. I don't think there's a trailer. Yeah, the autobiographical film that um, I made. It's going to be Potato uh, Dreams of America. <laughs> Beautiful. How did that nickname come about? Are you are you privy to tell your fans? like the nickname? Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, my mom had a bunch of different nicknames for me uh, in Russia, and uh, it was one of them. But the main reason why I had a nickname in the script and in the movie is just to create some distance between myself and to be able to talk about it in third person and kind yeah. of... Oh, that makes sense. It gets a little weird, you know. I hated my name in high school and because I was like this light-skinned, ambiguous, racially ambiguous kid and like easy target. Like my nickname was like Michael Jackson and you know, people called me fag all the time and I was soft-spoken and... Um, so I, I went by my middle name, Eric, for the longest time. And then as I, you know, grew up and got out of high school, or excuse me, grade school, I was like, you know what? There's nothing wrong with Kelly. There's nothing wrong with Kelly. So I'm back. Oh, beautiful name, yeah. Yeah. But maybe if I 
do porn or something, I'll go by Eric again. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> um, so you grew up in the Soviet Union, I read, and um, is it Vladivostok? Vladivostok? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I was, I was practicing. I was like, I think that's how you said. Um, so one of the things that stood out also researching you was um, the pirated American film portions of your documentaries with your mom, who we'll get to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> she's like a breakout star. Um, I loved that you mentioned Beetlejuice, Adam's Family Values, Curly Sue. Those are all things that were in my rotation. I think kind of helped form like my sense of humor, right? And I was mm -hmm. curious, um, I'm kind of jumping ahead, but while we're on topic, where does your humor come from? Because it's so well balanced with like the, just like the comedic timing. And then there's like this kind of under layer of innocence too. And like, yeah. obviously your visuals are very unique. It's very like when something pops up online, I'm like, oh, that's Wes's. So it's kind uh, of- Sweet, uh, thank you. Cool, it's it's quite the skill. So where does your, where did you get your humor from? Are they from the films or are there other sources you, you find inspiration from? Um, I think a lot of it came from my mom, honestly. She she was really funny growing up. She, she had really kind of biting sense of humor and um, yeah, it kind of slowly rubbed off. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm sure the those influences like Adam's Family, that kind of, uh, like Beetlejuice, all of those. Um, what else? I feel like there's another one in that. Right? Of, especially right. Adam's Family, the second one. The Adam's Family Values, right? Iconic. Um, the um, John Cusick's character is like my favorite person ever. <laughs> it was great. I think one of my favorite scenes is when she's in the car, the house hasn't blown up yet. She made the meatloaf as a bomb in it, and she's rehearsing what she's gonna say to the cops. I thought, I was like, what is this? What is this? <laughs> was there anything after shooting um, your documentaries with your mom that you thought, oh man, I forgot to include that film. That one was a favorite one of mine. Um, is there anything that after, like? Yeah, you know, probably not mainly because my, um, so I wrote the script for the feature like eight years ago. Okay. And then I've been trying to raise money for the feature. And at some point I got a little bit of grant money to meet the short doc. So I honestly had so much time to like think about it and think about like condensing my story, pulling out anything that's interesting or funny or, you know, any kind of twists or turns. And so by the time we shot the doc, I had a pretty down i think you you pulled me in for sure from the minute it started thank you yeah so one of the films i really was informed by too was peter jackson's uh dead alive have you seen that film yeah of course i love that, it that one was great the comedic gore the latina latin love interest was great and like the yeah. the two grandmothers the spiritual grandmother and then like the antagonist it was just like it was everything i needed right in a very handsome yeah, way. And, and those kind of handmade special effects, you know, that <laughs> I really love that. I really miss that because everything is so computer generated now. And like those older, the movies that we grew up with, um, you know, they had this kind of tangible quality because all the effects were done with like puppets and, yes. you know, makeup. And it's so fun to, I mean, to me, it's so much more fun than like computer generated stuff. Was it Rizalka? How do you pronounce that film? The, the... Rustalka. Rustalka? So the, that's a Slavic folklore mermaid film, right? Yeah, well, it's it's basically... Rusalka is like a Russian word for mermaid. Um, but the story I based mostly on Hans Christian Andersen's Little Mermaid. You know, I have to change it up a little bit, but... I didn't want it to be quite as tragic as the... I, I kind of wanted, like, the middle... Um, between Hans Christian Andersen's story is pretty gruesome. I don't know if you know how like the original Little Mermaid has a really gruesome, depressing end. Like she's she died this torturous death, and it's like so she sad. Sea foam, sea foam, right? She turned into yeah, foam. yeah. Um, you know, and then on the other hand, Disney's story is so like over the top, happy ending. And I wanted sort of the middle where it's like he he didn't get what he wanted out of this, 
but there's hope and it's not he doesn't die a horrible torturous death. Right? Well <laughs> the thing I wanted the thing I wanted to mention and kudos to you is that we were, you were talking about special effects earlier, how it was tangible. I love the transformation. I don't want to give total spoilers away, but oh, the transformation was really good. I was like, oh, oh, okay. I let, it was effective. Thank you. Eric Warren is a local uh, special effects guy who's it was kind of a genius and he gets my kind of lo-fi aesthetic and, you know, practical effects stuff and he loves it. So it's, I forgot what he used. There was either zip ties. There's something really, really like mundane that you wouldn't expect that he used for the rig. <laughs> yeah. So it's really, it was fun to watch. Random question. Favorite uh, Pedro and Moldavar film? Oh, I would say uh, the skin. I, uh, what is it? The skin I live in, or the skin? Yeah, I live skin in? I'm in, or skin I live in. Yeah, I know what yeah. you're talking. About. It's so creepy and weird. <laughs> One that's most fresh in my head is uh, Volver with uh, Pen uh, Penelope. Yeah. Uh, Still go by Penelope Cruz. I can't remember. Yeah, she's in it. Yeah, I love that one too. I actually just rewatched that with my mom recently. It's so good. I love that. I remember going to see that at I think it was Cinema Twenty One here in Portland. And uh, one of the things I missed, uh, I really miss, is taking myself out to the films. That, that that was my like solo date night thing to do. Do you miss yeah, going to the theaters? You you have the best theaters in Portland too, because we <laughs> we do it all the time, and we go, you know, Cinema Twenty One, Laurelhurst is so nice. Yeah, I'm forgetting the one that's like, it's beautiful, really old theater. I think it only has like two screens. Is it Hollywood Theater or? Hollywood, and then there's Baghdad, there's Mission Theater downtown. But uh, it's amazing how many like really great boutique kind of smaller old theaters you have. Like Seattle, most of them has shut down in Seattle. So it's uh, I'm so a sorry. treat to go to like Portland and, and you know, the prices are reasonable. You can eat usually most of them. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, so we go, we literally like wait to go to Portland. We haven't gotten this here, but usually we go like you know six seven times a year and just catch up on movies while we're nice. there like see everything well like you said places are closing down so i hope some of these gems we spoke of survive you know it's it's disheartening um because we you know i think we're ready to get back to some kind of normality yeah <laughs> but are thought... theaters completely closed or are they like at capacity or so like for example baghdad mcminimum <laughs> Um, their restaurants open, but their theaters closed until further notice. I don't know. But um, I think there's places in California that are reopening. And I heard New York, some of their theaters are reopening. But you're in Seattle? And yeah. What was it like growing up in the 90s? Like, do you have any, like, epic fashion photos of you, like, rocking out some 90s gear? Oh, my God. Well, you know, because I grew up in Russia, like, our fashion was very behind. <laughs> so, like, we were... <laughs> We were still in the 80s, like in the early 90s, we were still like in the early 80s. Everything was kind of delayed. Um, I don't have a lot of cool photos of me, but I, I do remember I was kind of a, like a fashion rebel for a moment. Like, yes. I, I saw this movie, um, do you, I don't know if you've seen it, this horror movie, Warlock, with Julian Sands, yep. and he has a ponytail in it. <laughs> I got obsessed with ponytail, so I grew my hair out, and for a little bit I had sort of, it wasn't quite like a ponytail, it was like a mullet. And then, um, yes. so, and that was like radical, because nobody had long hair in my school, so people made fun of me. You're like, what? Flip that. But I'm just like, I'm just like Warlock. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, boldness to stick out. And you know, it's funny how things cycle around, how things are li like that, or that aesthetic is like, in people like purposefully go to the salon to get the mullet to get the like yeah. you know poofy 80 sweater or what have you yeah i'm seeing that i'm seeing like i, I can see you know the mullet is kind of coming back like on the, on the fringes but i think it's just a matter of time <laughs> before it's like a big you know yeah, I mean, like, like men bun and all of that a wig for me but you know <laughs> that's what that's what wigs are for yeah i need a mullet wig for sure you look um, great in wigs. I was just checking out all your videos, and yeah. I clean up nicely, don't I? <laughs> I love the kind of chameleon uh, aesthetic I can kind of tap into and 
you know, like the other day I was, I had some friends over, we were social distancing, but um, I had like a box of wigs and we were just like playing around and it, it yeah. felt great to kind of just feel like someone else for a moment. No, you really transform. It's really fun. I was like, oh my God, that is Kelly. Yeah. Ah. Um, um, speaking of transformation, like your mom in these documentaries, okay, first of all, um, I hope this is okay to say, but your mom's kind of hot. Like your mom. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. This is this is my first kind of deep dive into your history, right? I was like, oh my god, it's Alina, right? Her name's Alina. Yeah. I just feel like personally, as a viewer, her candor came through, her heart came through, and she leaped off the screen. And it's really cool to talk to you about your humor and how that kind of trickled down from her. So basically what I'm seeing is like the retelling of your story, but it's evolving, it's getting bigger. It's like your your production's looking beautiful. How is she kind of viewing that? And what, what are conversations like, I guess, that, I mean, does she recognize this as gaining momentum? And she's kind of like a, a you know, just like this superstar. She, she's excited, just so shy and humble, you know, that, um... Like, I, I can totally see her being uncomfortable, like, at a screening if people start, you know. <gasps> oh, my God! Uh, yeah. Like, and girling out. <laughs> yeah. but, she, but she's excited, you know, like, we, um, there's two actresses playing her in the film, and she really likes both of them. Um, she, she was really, she was really generous in terms of, like, me telling the story. She didn't try to you know, influence me in any way or like put any pressure on me. The only thing that she said, she was like, you know, because she grew up with curly black hair and it's like, in Russia, it's like ethnic and not okay. And like, you know, there's a lot of kind of stigma and issues around curly black hair there. And she was like, do not have like a blonde <laughs> stranger <laughs> girls <play> me. <laughs> So the actress who plays her in America, we, we created this wig that looks, you know, just like my mom's hair and it totally looks great. But um, that was her only request is like, <laughs> can I not be blonde? <laughs> Other than that, yeah, she's, um, she's, she was excited. She got like, she got to meet, um, you know, Dan Loria from The Wonder Years who played the dad on Wonder Years. He plays our stepfather in the movie. So she got to meet him. And she was really excited because she actually watched the show with her husband that he plays, like a weird meta thing, oh, you know? Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah, I think it's new to her. Like, it's not, it's like my world. The film world is my world. It's not her world. So she, you know, it's not quite her thing, but she's very supportive. She's excited. She's... You should um, make the set photos look great, by the way. Thank you. She didn't let me. I tried to show her the film. She wants to see it like with an audience when it's, you know, completely finished. Oh, so she's holding out. She's like, no, 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 no spoilers. Yeah, yeah. She's what? seen some scenes, but she, she's like, I want to have that experience, you know, like a full experience. So I'm curious of where her love for film came from, too. Like, do you know where that came from? Because you guys were both watching like the American dubbed um, film. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think part of it is just, you know, escape because she had a really hard, you know, she was a single mom. She was super poor. She was being, you know, kind of, she had this horrible job at prison where she was getting death threats. Like, Jeez. so she, um, you know, struggling with depression and anxiety. And so I think she really escaped into books uh, mostly and then movies, you know, books were just more available and then movies. Um, and the movies the, the, that came from the States were so much more hopeful. Yeah. And it was Channel but 3, right? Where huh? Ghost, Channel 3? Yeah, Ghost <laughs> was the first one. Yeah. Um, it's so sweet because, uh, you know, Whoopi got, through a friend, Whoopi got to see the short doc. And so she, she wrote me this beautiful email, um, like supporting the project and just, ah. it, was, it was the most... It came at the right time because I was really struggling with the feature and I got that email and I was like, okay, I'm on the right track. <laughs> like, I got, I just oh, got it. It was like, That's, my God, you know. <laughs> that I, I swear to you, um, there's times I've just, you know, thought about quitting music, thought about walking away, you know, get a real job, as my parents <laughs> reluctantly <laughs> used to say to me. But 
there are people that drop in our lives, I feel that at the right time and they just give you that message. Um, I was talking yeah. to a friend of mine in New York and he was just like, we we're talking, we're gonna have him on the show, his name's David. And he was just mirroring and reflecting how important this platform is for whether they're people that are known or unknowns, like just to have our stories told. Um, and he just gave me this boost of confidence. You're giving me a boost of confidence. Like I, I was, definitely like shocked and nervous in a good way to have you on i i just i'm a huge fan and oh you're so sweet yeah that's beautiful i'm a fan too thank you are you how did you have you have you always wanted to do this in terms of hosting a show like this or is it sort of a new outlet um inspired by the whole crazy year or <laughs> that's a great question um so both um, my friend and I, back when I used to work at Bishop's Barbershop, the rock and roll barbershop that gives out free beer, back in the day, she was like, oh, you should have a Kelly Mo show, like, obviously. And I was like, yeah, that would be great one day. Um, I think that back then in the early 2000s, in my mid 20s, like my skill set in terms of editing wasn't developed. Um, I think it was about 2007 I was able to co-produce the Voodoo Engine music video with local film director James Westby. So I kind of, over, I, yeah, thank you. I've been, over time, been able to watch people's process, collaborate, um, get better at graphic design. So there's like these little pockets of skill sets. And then I think due to COVID and just sitting with myself and maybe microdosing on pot a lot, um, <laughs> <laughs> I... I was like, I gotta do something. And and I want it to be a platform for storytelling, but I also want the tone to be of heart, of kindness, a, a, a pledge to positivity, because there's just so much chatter, right? And I wanted something that kind of cut through that and really be just optimistic and, 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 yeah. and fun and interesting, so. That's wonderful. A great question, for sure. It's like we're both taking advantage of being able to edit these things, right? While we have time. Because you were it's touring. So funny that you, you, you mentioned like, you know, video editing in the beginning was challenging. And I, listening to your music, I was thinking how overwhelmingly challenging it seems to me, like the designing of the tracks, because there's so much, you know, um, there's so many layers to your music. And I'm like, how does he even know to like, and when to stop, when right? To start. Yeah, when to stop, where to start, pulling all those different uh, elements there. So, yeah. Well, I don't, maybe it's the same for you too. When you, as you get older and you acquire more skill sets, there's more options of how to express your art, right? So it's almost like maddening in a way, in a good way, essentially, that, okay, I can do this, I can do that. But it's like that, that the ability to edit, I think is good. So I don't know about you. Do you ever have to walk away from a project, step away and just kind of breathe and then come back and watch it again. Yeah, because yeah, you get, you lose a sense of what it is, right? After a while, you just, uh, you can't even see it objectively anymore, hear it. I'm sure it's the same thing. Like, uh, yeah. like but, I don't know what I'm doing anymore. It's so... <laughs> like, if you need to take a break and come back, do you watch the whole thing? That's a lot of dedicated time to really understand the flow of a film, right? So... Do you mean um, my own film when I'm editing or? Yeah. yeah um, no, I mean, you start out with scenes, individual scenes. So, you know, I will work on the scene for a long time um, and get it to the point where it's pretty solid. And then, you know, once I have all of them, I'll combine them into a feature. And then once, sorry, it's just our birds. They're usually not loud. It's your roommate. <laughs> No birds, yeah, we have birds, and they're, they're, yeah, they're out of control. What kind of birds? Um, they're, they're like sh I rescued birds, um, um, cockatiels, I think. They're little ones. They're like this big, cute. <laughs> but yeah, you know, once you put the whole thing together, then you're you're seeing it as a whole. Then you start like seeing, okay, maybe this is not necessary, or it's missing this, but. Yeah, it, it, it does get very challenging once you, once you're at that stage where it's the whole film and you kind of have to see the whole film to get a sense of it. It does get challenging because it's like there's only so many times you can watch it before you're like, I don't even know anymore. I don't know. You know, things that were funny are not funny anymore. Things that were touching are not touching anymore. <laughs> 
Like, it's, like I don't, I don't know. <laughs> so something I do um, before we move on um, is I'll, I have a small group of friends that I'll send a track to you before it's done, and I'll kind of mm -hmm. one of them is my 16 year old niece. She'll give it to me straight. She'll she'll <laughs> say eh, maybe take that out or like for example in Rocketeer this new single I released a couple weeks ago. She's like, she's like, I don't really understand the beginning. And I was like, oh, and it was like a poem. <laughs> I was like, yeah. you, don't, you don't like my poem, girl? She's like, just the beat's great, just get to the beat. And I was like, all right, all right. Note taken, not necessarily gonna change it, but. Your team is really impressive. I wanna get to that in a moment, but do you, do you ever like phone a friend or have someone you show that's kind of on your speed dial? And they're like, yeah. oh, you're doing great. Absolutely, yeah, you, you have to. You have to, and it's funny you mentioned your niece. It's so good to have somebody like that who's not gonna hold back to, you know, because <laughs> that's tricky with friends. And I, you know, like, honestly, I'm not the best feedback giver because with friends, because I would never, if I hated something, I'll, like, I'm never gonna be honest. <laughs> like, I just can't, I can't hurt my feelings, you know what I mean? Like, I can't. So, <laughs> and, and knowing that about me, I know I'm not the only one like that. So it's, Totally. You do have to find those people who are like, will just speak the truth to you right. and not care about you. <laughs> if you're gonna go cry in the corner afterwards. <laughs> I think that that criticism, though, personally in life, and I've been criticized. I'm not for everyone, but that's 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 the beautiful thing about art, it's, um, subjective. But it's it's made me consider it, not necessarily absorb it, and become better in some way. Like I guess it's just. If, if someone's like, hey, I couldn't hear what you said in that song, then I think about enunciation and I actually, those critiques have made me, an, you know, a pronounce yeah, yeah. my words better. So uh, I do appreciate the, the hard talk sometimes, so. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to find somebody who's like, um, like for example, for this film, I edited most of it myself, but I had a consulting editor in LA that I reached nice. out and I found, um, She's a wonderful editor, um, Annette Davy, and she, the thing about those kinds of people is you have to find somebody who like gets your vision and is brutally honest at the same time, because you know, there's different kinds of feedback. It's like, there's somebody who's going to listen to you and just be like, well, this is just not, you know, like they're going to try to make you something that you're not, that you're not meant to be versus there's somebody who's going to listen to you and be like, well, I get what you're doing but I know how you can do it better. And so I think for every artist, there's somebody like that. And that's important to find that kind of person because a lot of feedback is just like, well, you're not, you just don't get me. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, and you have to just kind of discount all of that crap. But also there's a lot of stuff where it's like, well, you get me, but you know how I can improve. And there's power in that humility, not humiliation, but humility of like, okay, like I don't know everything, but like, thank you for pointing that out. Let me consider it. And then, you know, regardless of how that pans out, like, um, yeah, I, I think that having yes men around is great to an extent, but then how do we push ourselves forward to, to evolve, you know, and having those, like one of the co-producers I have on music in LA, he always gives it to me straight. I appreciate it too, but, um, Anyway, um, I could talk to you forever, but I wanted to go over a couple more things. Um, and speaking of your work and your process, obviously it's gaining momentum because I think you, the, the grant you mentioned, it was from For Culture, the Kings County Cultural Service Agency, right? I got that for the short doc, yeah. And then we got Creative Capital for the feature, which was like the biggest thing I've ever gotten. Mm -hmm. it was... And that, was that grant in 2012-ish or? The folk culture was, I think, 2016, and then... Um, and then you produced... The capital was last year. It was last year. Congratulations. Thank you. That I mean, that, was, that really made it the feature possible, because it was $50,000, and I, if I didn't get it, I would have not been able to make the film. It was kind of life-changing. That's incredible. And the, the grant for, for culture was for the Potato Dreams of America? Was that, was that like the... That was for the short version, yeah. yeah. The short doc. Okay. Yeah. So your cinematographer is Nathan Miller. I don't, I, I'm not aware of his uh, work other than working with you. How did you guys, like, how did he come across your radar? I'm just curious. Well, Nate, so Nate, Nate and I only worked on Little Potato. And okay. then I have Vincent Pierce, who's done everything else, like the feature, the uh, Capitol Hill series, all of my shorts. Um, 
and they're both really wonderful in different ways. You know, Nate um, is somebody because like I admired, he's a local um, DP who's done a lot of great work and worked with like Lynn Shelton, who's our like Seattle favorite filmmaker who unfortunately passed away this year very tragically and suddenly. Um, but he's also partners with um, one of my producers who produced Little Potato, the doc, the short doc. So we, you know, we got together, we started talking about the project, we really clicked. Um, he's a really, really talented guy. Yeah, I kind of miss him because he's in LA a lot of the time now. Um, yeah, and Vincent, um, who's my DP for everything else, uh, including this feature, he uh, produces and directs show for a local Seattle channel station. Cool. Um, and he just, he saw my, my first feature film, uh, which was like super gorilla style <laughs> and like super, super crazy, you know, kind of John Water-esque. And he was like, I love what you're doing. Uh, do you want it to look better? <laughs> you know, and I was like, yes, please, yes. You know, that br brutal honesty, I love it, right? Yeah, I mean, he was super supportive. Like he got what I'm trying to do. You know, it's one of those things where it's like, he got what I was trying to do, but he was like, I know I can make it look better. <laughs> so I was like, yes, please. There's so much to admire with someone that just puts it out there and you know, uh, some of the critiques that I don't personally listen to is like, oh, like that doesn't sound done yet, but like I don't always have like um, the resources to master all my music or time. So I, I do put out things that are raw sometimes, but I know that I can go back and like remaster it and like swap yeah. out the file. So, um, but uh, how did the gay themed uh, Capitol Hill series come about? I'm curious. As a that fan, is fan. like my thank you. Thank you so much. That came out of my like deep, deep love for um, campy like 70s, 80s TV shows, American TV shows. Because sometimes we would get those in Russia like in bits and pieces. Like I've seen a few episodes of like Murder, She Wrote and Love Boat and Fantasy Island and Remington Steel, Charlie's Angels, all of those uh -huh. things. So I wanted to like combine that, um, you know, aesthetic, but make it super, super queer and like... <laughs> right amount of kink and drag. Yeah, like kinky and kind of, uh, you know, and, uh, like core elements, because uh, I love, I really love horror films. So like, I try to marry all these elements that I love into something new, but still make it feel like it was made in the 70s. It's you know, there's sort of a very specific style and rhythm to those shows and how they would have those commercial breaks. And like, <laughs> Yes. You know, the musical cues come in at the same time and they're all the same. <laughs> there's sort of like, there's a very specific quality that I wanted to capture and um, I'm did. really happy. Yeah, with what um, our team has done. Thank you. I'm, I'm really excited to revisit both seasons. I think I blew through both seasons. Um, also, fans like me want to know Capitol Hill season three. Thank you. I'd love to make it. I, I wrote it. Um, it's it's all written. I'm really excited. It's it's uh it's gonna be on a cruise ship. <laughs> it's I'm basically bad. like yes! my boat expired. But um, yeah, I want to raise some money for it. You know, it's gonna be tricky because the last two seasons I just put on my it, they were basically nobody got paid. Uh, I put it on my credit card, it, you know, and I okay. I have to start making work more sustainably. So that's my goal is to. You know, like this feature, this Potato Dreams of America, we got uh, investors on board. So what you do, we pay people. It was, you know, it was like a step. Yeah. What you do has value. And, you know, if if I have time, I'm happy to help in any way in terms of fundraising. I have like a, a bit of a background and I want to kind of expand those wings. Um, but speaking of, you. yeah, speaking of Capitol Hill, um, I was curious of how Waxy Moon kind of came into your orbit because she is such a presence. I, I love her aesthetic. I, I, she's in one of the films. I think it was the, do, 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 which one was it? Um, one of the short films. Zolushka? Yeah. She, <laughs> yeah she's... That was my favorite, by the way, out of the, out of the three. <laughs> I just, I just identified with it. And there's some scenes in there that we'll talk about that are fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Um... 
So Waxy Moon um, is a creation of Mark Kennison, who was my teacher at in college, basically. <laughs> it was one of my <laughs> first teachers in college, acting teachers. And uh, we really hit it off. Uh, we kind of bonded over like our love of gay history and gay culture and wanted to make work that was, you know, gay and queer and all of those things. And uh, so we stayed in touch. Um, and a few years after I graduated, Mark really got into burlesque and created this amazing um, burlesque persona, Waxy Moon. And it just blew up, you know, in Seattle, he was really huge. There's like mural of him, uh, her yeah. in- Belltown, right? My no. Place Market, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah downtown. Um, because, you know, he, he has this incredible background as like a Juilliard trained dancer and like role, you know, he like performed as a dancer for like Clinton's and the White House, like really high end dancer. And then all this acting training. So when he, um, when he started to do burlesque, it was like burlesque on this very high, high level. And I just fell in love with this kind of, you know, the, the, I fell in love with how the audiences would react to, you know, cause it's like, it's such an interesting thing playing with gender in this way. That's not, that's very, at the time that was pretty uncomfortable. I think now we're getting to this kind of gender, uh, world's catching up for me. You know, like I go out and like every other clerk at a store <laughs> is, is like Waxy Moon is like wearing a dress, has a beard, just like makeup. I think at the time it was very, um, it was like, oh my God, what, you know, this is a guy, but it's a woman, but he would channel this femininity so beautifully, even in a very male body. And I just love that disconnect and this kind of, what it would do to the audience because by the end of the show you could see like everybody was on board you know what i mean totally uh like everybody's like okay this is a lady i guess <laughs> like it just was you just got that waxy moon was her and mm -hmm. i also i love a good handlebar mustache i have a date with someone later with that has a handlebar mustache nice. thinking of um you know waxy <laughs> moon um Sweet. yeah great casting just Great cast. Thank you. Again, it'll be really cool to revisit Capitol Hill, and that's really exciting that there's a potential for season three. And if there's anything I can do in terms of just getting the word out for maybe sponsors or like a, an event when we can, maybe we can do a digital event, or hopefully we can, you know, have COVID resolved to some degree where we can, like have an event to raise money in person. So that's all really exciting as a fan and just someone that wants to see you succeed. Oh, thank you. You're very kind. Thank you. About those short films, um, Solushka, is that right? Uh-huh. That was my personal favorite. The rimming lineup, I mean, I rolled off my bed laughing and the sex scene with the salad being tossed, it was just like that. <laughs> the fact that that came out of your brain and resonates with me is just the best thing, the best kind of cap to such a crazy year. Um, <laughs> Do you just see scenes in your head or is it part improv, part stuff you definitely have scripted and you're like, okay, cut away to blah, blah, blah. Yeah, no, it's never improv. I usually, I usually kind of brew it all in my head. I have very specific ideas about what I want and, you know, we storyboard. It's never, ever improv with me. Yeah, but that's, it works. Um, do you ever have a thought or an idea or you're um, storyboarding and you just like laugh out loud or someone like, next year's reading it and they just lose it do you ever have those moments I do, I do i mean i don't know it's like capitol hill specifically i i love so much i mean like everything else i've done when i look at you know other films i've done i'm like i see them something wrong with it or it was like i i wish i could have done it differently or better but with capitol hill i'm like whenever i watch it i'm just laughing and laughing i'm like yeah. in my own jokes you know <laughs> <laughs> This is so funny! I'm so funny! <laughs> it's genius. Um, also, I noticed your music choices stood out to me in a really cool way. Um, mostly the juxtaposition with like classical instrumentals, like woven in with like modern LGBTQ focused stories. And then also, like I said, that that humor and that sense of innocence. That's That's like that's a big deal to weave those things together and have it translate. And it does, I think, successfully. What was your process having music involved in film? Like, was it stuff that you've had on playlists or just saved? Or like, do people send you stuff? Like, 
What's your relationship with music and then adding it to your film? What's that process look like? Well, thank you, first of all. Uh, I mean, that's really nice of you to say. The um, Yeah, it's different for different films. So like for for the short fairy tales, I found public, um, public domain, really old recordings of the classical score. Um, and they go, they actually are from, you know, so like Zoloshka is Cinderella and there's like a Cinderella opera. Uh, Peter and the Wolf, you know, is um, an orchestral piece that inspired, actually inspired the short. That Peter and the Wolf actually was quite arousing to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Woo! And then for like, for stuff like Capitol Hill, um, I recruited uh, this composer in LA, um, Katrin Joy, who's really amazing. And she, she's so versatile. And so I basically told her, you know, this is like a very specific style. It's a, it's like a 70s TV style. It's very specific in terms of what instruments it uses. And it's kind of cheesy in a way, like, I don't, you know, and she was really on board and she, I, I think she did a beautiful job. And then I would find sort of some people to collaborate with, like, um, um, Prom Queen is an amazing Seattle um, performer who has this kind of um, old timey, I don't know, Lana Del Rey meets like David Lynch soundtrack quality. So I've been a fan of hers for a long time and I asked her to write a song for Capitol Hill. So she did that. Um, okay. But sometimes it's just, you know, find, you know, like listening pe to people's music and liking it and being like, this is appropriate for the scene or not like my latest feature is primarily original score but then there's a few songs from like the 90s grunge scene in seattle that i thought is important because yes. the, you know the film takes place in the 90s in seattle so it's like it needs to have that so you basically have a super brain like it's just it's great that you can see these moments in your head script them know what kind of sound you want find the resources of people, like if you can't do it yourself to get that done and just have this like masterpiece, like even if it's a short film or a feature, like that's that's an incredible gift, seriously. Oh, thank you, thank and, you like, so much. What a cool team, like, and I, I looked through the team of the upcoming feature film and it, it was a pretty diverse staff, lots of like just different genders, different people. And is that team kind of cultivated over time or um, have you had like the kind of same people you've worked with for a while? I know you mentioned um, obviously Nate and, and other people, yeah. actors and such, but are new um, people coming into the fold? Uh, new people are always coming into the fold. And, you know, some people are kind of, we part ways, not, not, not in a bad way, but it's like, you know, just because I work with so little resources, it's like, yeah people get burned out too. So I, I lose some collaborators, you know, I've lost some people over the years, which is always sad, but I also would never, you know, I totally get it. It's like, you have to, you know, you have to take care of yourself first. Yeah, for sure. Gotta make sure. Um, so it's, it, you know, it's always evolving. I mean, there's definitely people like Waxy Moon has always been part of my creative work. So like, even though he's not in the, film in the latest film but he choreographed some numbers for yeah, the film. That's awesome. Ah! So it's you know it's definitely an evolving thing. I'm proud of our you know our crew is a lot of women too which is rare in film like all, almost all of the producers and kind of people behind the scenes a lot of them are women and gay. That's fantastic. I mean uh, you're creating just a beautiful movement. Um, random question, favorite wardrobe piece you've seen on set? Mine personally is the magenta cowboy hat in Reluska. Um, <laughs> or the leather jacket that the biker drives off with in Peter and the Wolf. Those, those uh, like, do you have those pieces? I, no, so I gave the jacket, I gave to Pete, uh, my friend Pete who played Peter and the Wolf, because he <laughs> loved it. And it's totally him. Um, I don't know what happened to the hat. I really love this. I mean, this is kind of a mean dress. Um, the dress that Waxy wears in season one, episode one, uh, <laughs> with the theme and jinx, and it's like this gold outfit, and it was so painful. Like, I, I, I'm, I, I don't like, it's not, I don't, that's not the reason why I like it, is because it's painful, <laughs> Waxy. <laughs> 
<laughs> but it's basically made out of this, I don't know, like metal or plastic. It's like this chain mail thing, but it's so beautiful. It's like, because it looks like pure gold. It just looks like something out of like, you know, the 50s staging of a like Cleopatra or something. It's just like so gaudy. <laughs> yeah, but he, he couldn't move in it. It was, it was, he was like, I can't, I can't, yeah. Well, struck a, a striking figure. Um, speaking of Waxy Moon and season one of Capitol Hill, I have not laughed. Okay, I've laughed really hard in like, I think Margaret Cho's first stand up, but the second time I've laughed from my gut where it hurts is your depiction of Portlanders as backwoods, <laughs> swamp, inbred, missing some teeth. It, because it just, it was such a read on Portland, but I loved it. <laughs> it was so good. I was like, bitch. But um, yeah, I there's some crusty people I've met. So I was like, yeah, that's, that's, that's fair. <laughs> it's so funny because, you know, people read a lot into it and it's totally, it's meant to be funny because it's random. Uh, you know, because obviously I love Portland. I love Portland because I it reminds me of Seattle so much. It's, to me, it's just like Seattle, like Portland, Vancouver, BC, kind of. Seattle, we all kind of have a very similar yeah. feel, you know? As, as I joke, it's Portland, Seattle light. <laughs> yeah, totally. But it's south of Seattle, so I was like, okay, the, like taking this idea that because it's in the south, <laughs> you know, it's like south. So th that's literally where it came from. It's like, okay, it's south of Seattle. I didn't find it offensive at all. I thought it was per. It was just, it just made, in the context of the story and the visual, it was, it was beautiful. I... I haven't laughed that hard. Like, again, there's only two times. So I was like, this guy is going places for sure. <laughs> Thank do, you get, you. do you get recognized in Seattle? Like going out? Sometimes, sometimes yeah. Not, not, I mean, not, you know, not, I'm not a celebrity by any means, but I do get recognized a little bit. That's awesome. What a cool place in Seattle's culture. What a cool place in the international stage of um, art, you know, I, I I I haven't read your BBC profile yet, but I'm gonna do that later. Um, it seems like your story and your network and your team and your vision is just bountiful. It's it's evolving, and I I hope that you know that it, it's effective to people like me that question whether or not I should give up or not. But the fact that you uh, no, you're no you're so talented. I'm so glad you're yeah. No, you should be making work. You're so talented. I'm, I'm in it for sure. It's really cool that you also provide the Huffington Post articles. Um, I, I think I've read one, but um, if you can send me links to that stuff, that would be great. Or just yeah, I will. I, I no longer, they like they changed their system. So they got rid of, I think, majority of their contributors uh, okay. along with me. But, it, you know, it was good while it lasted because it gave me an opportunity to like promote. I usually just used it to promote my friend's work, honestly. That's you know, because cool. especially, you know, in Seattle and I mean, the same with Portland. It's like the the state, the media is so L.A., New York centered, which I, I really resent because I think there's so much talent in the Northwest. And uniqueness, yes. you know, we have our own unique culture and our own sort of arts that are coming out of here are so special. And so that was an opportunity for me to kind of, you know, um, celebrate those artists and creators. But yeah, it was good while it lasted. <laughs> Do you think that the business, the, the Hollywood model will change due to either um, just the digital evolution or climate change maybe like just it's more sustainable farther up north do you see like the business moving up north or have you noticed anything change about that i think it will you know i mean i really think it will i i'm not i think tangibly right now it's i don't think it's happening at the moment um but it really will. I mean, it has to because, like you said, you know, climate change is a big part of it. Um, just in terms of, like, people not really wanting to live in the desert if it's not sustainable anymore, you know. And then um, for most films, like, you really don't need to make them in L.A. anymore. Like, I, I, I think certain, you know, if you're making, like, a huge superhero movie, you need those sound stages that we just don't have yeah. anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, I mean, maybe like Canada and Toronto or something has studios like that. But 
But if you're just making regular films that are not like huge epic soundstage movies, you you can make them anywhere, and you should, because again, I think it it creates this regional kind of flavor. You know, it's like there's yeah. you know, America is so diverse in terms of like viewpoints and communities all around the country that are so different, and I think it's good to like see art created and different in all of those places because there it's going to be different, right? It's going to be like. The aesthetic, maybe like the local music that's featured on the project. Yeah, I'm I'm a, a fan of that for sure. I joke that we'll know that the business has changed if we're like out. I'm making a music video or what have you, and like I get stopped by the police for a permit, a filming permit. I'll be like, oh, they're here, they're here. <laughs> <laughs> um, you also produced some commercials for the Fred Hutchinson. Is that correct, Fred? Uh, Fred, Fred Hutchinson uh, Cancer Research Institute. Yeah. That's really awesome. Um, quickly, how did you get involved? Are there any kind of nonprofits and organizations that are on your radar that you want our viewers to be aware of? Yeah, I um, so Fred Hutch. They approached me um, after Capitol Hill season one, um, you know, premiered and was fairly successful. And they they were working on this uh, HIV vaccine trials, and they wanted to attract, um, you know, to attract basically young you know, gay men and trans people to um, to the trials. And I was kind of surprised. I was like, well, it, it's a racy show, you know, you're gonna, because they're a very big established institution. Like they're one of the leading cancer research institutions in the world. And um, and they were like, no, we, we love that it's racy. We want, you know, we want it to be kind of hip and young and attract younger people. So um, they, they partnered up with us. They gave us a grant, and then I I shot this intros with um, Alexandra Billings, who's an amazing trans um, actress in LA, who's in Transparent, oh, sweet. and a bunch of local performers as well, like Alexa Manila and Luminous Pariah, and uh, and so basically we would have b before every episode of Capitol Hill, we'd have like a little intro promoting the HIV vaccine trials and from what I hear they're they've been really promising so far so fingers crossed that you know I would love the links to that to kind of um, have in the, um, the yeah. description so people can click on it and be aware of it and get involved or donate if they can um, that's incredible um, I guess I just wanted to kind of finish out with like what would you say to gay people who are struggling with their identity or, or not able to come out like I feel like you're this beautiful shining beacon of light and I'm curious if there's anyone watching that may be doubtful about their future. What is there anything that's um, on your mind these days to tell people like that? I mean, I, it's such a cliche to say, but I, I think you know it does. It really does get better, you know. And for young people, especially, I think you know if you're really young and if you're in an unsafe situation. Um, it's it's okay to like hold off on coming out until. You, you know, until you're able to move away from your parents and be safe and be in a safe environment. Um, but it does get better. Like, as I remember, you know, I remember being that age and really feeling like nothing's going to get better. Like, my life will always suck. And, like, I'm so grateful that I didn't give up because there's so many things, amazing things that await you if you just hang in there and... You know, and I, and I would say to, to people, you know, move. If you're, if you're able to move in a place that's more accepting, um, do that and try to surround with yourself with people who are like-minded people and kind people and not self-destructive people. <laughs> you know, all of those things are important because, you, you know, it's like whoever you hang out with, you kind of, by osmosis, you absorb all of that energy, you know, whatever that is, if it's... I agree kind and, or compassionate or ambitious energy, whatever it is, you, you kind of... And I think the reason I asked that question to flesh it out a bit is because we're in a pandemic, so a lot of people are quarantined. And I was talking to a friend the other day about, you know, I, I have my struggles, I have my uh, depression, um, but I can't imagine... I mean, I also have uh, some kind of uh, advantage, privilege in life where I had access to therapy. So I was able to kind of build a skill set or a wheelhouse of being able to reach out or communicate when I'm in trouble to 
a very small group of people, but that's been so crucial to get through this. I can't imagine not having those resources and feeling trapped. So that's why I asked the question so people can at least watch a video like this and be like, you know what? Look at this beautiful artist trajectory and the fact that he didn't give up. Maybe I can also believe in myself in the same fashion, so. I mean, mental health, that's a, that's a really big thing. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. I think it's so important to, you know, get help and I feel like there are resources everywhere, right? There's like support, you know, lines, uh, suicide lines, um, different resources for gay teenagers and LGBT teenagers. And it's so important to seek help because yeah, I mean, mental, like nobody is completely healthy, mentally healthy, you know, to me, it's like, I, I think of it as like, there's not a person whose body is completely healthy. Like everybody gets colds and flus and things. And it's like, we have to think of mental health the same way. We, we have to think of it as like, you will get sick, you know, and at some point you will need help. Like everybody does. And it's, there's no shame in it. And to break that illusion of everything needs to be shiny and happy and perfect, um, you know, is so, grounding in a, in a soulful way to say it's okay to be unperfect, it's okay to be, you know, struggling or flawed. Um, what I'll do also, I'll do a little research in Seattle and Portland, since that's kind of where we're uh, frequenting these days, and I'll go ahead and add some uh, hotlines, because Lord knows I've called them myself in the past, so. Um, yeah, that's great. That's, I mean, that's, that's what I would, I mean, in Seattle, I know we have Seattle Counseling Service, um, and that's a specifically organization for LGBT um, people struggling with, you know, whatever they're struggling with, addiction, um, depression, anxiety. Um, and I know people who run it and, you know, there's like amazing stories. So when they used to, when they started in the 70s, being gay was illegal. And they would, um, the director of the organization would have like basically explosive devices in his office because if police raided the place they wanted to destroy all you know because people couldn't be outed back then like it was you had to like destroy all evidence of your patients because that would out them oh my God. So we're, we're so lucky to live in this time where at least we don't have to worry about that fortunately most you know I mean, I, I like to tell myself things aren't getting worse or getting revealed. We still have a lot of work to do. I think as you mentioned in one of your articles about, I think it was post the Orlando shooting and I still resonate with that. You know, it's like, I, I don't feel comfortable being com like comfortable. So yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Um, but I really, I am even more of a fan after talking with you, getting to know you finally. I really appreciate your patience as I um, kind of start this new project and and anytime i've talked over you it's just because i'm excited no you're doing great you're really doing great awesome i think you're natural thank you oh my yeah. god do you have any questions um and we'll do some follow-up communication if um my yeah, can you uh, the cover for your latest album it's really beautiful the the star the face kind of yeah the rock the stars, what, what how who created it can you talk about it or, um, so I, I was going to use that image for the new album. Uh, it's my 27th studio album called Valley Speak. So oh, wow. I would love to chat with you later too about aesthetic because it's, it's Valley Speak referring to the 90s speech and like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the film and like I love um, that. those things that influence me in pop culture. But then it's also like you know, what happens when I'm sitting in the desert eating weed, valley speak, like what kind of channels through. And so I'm going to marry those two things together. And I would love to kind of create this like trippy aesthetic that's kind of vintage. Like I, I love vintage futurism. I think that's yeah. I think you kind of have an eye for that as well. Um, so I, I was, I think I had a, a song on loop and I was on bfunky.com, which is kind of like Photoshop, but cheaper. Um, and I was just kind of tinkering around and then I I got that cool image and then I put like a filter on it and then it evolved over time and I just love the overall feel and I think it captured the song. I ended up not necessarily intending it on being the album cover, but then I used it for the Rocketeer front cover or the cover art for Rocketeer. Um, yeah. Like that kind of drowny guitar, trippy, um, smooth, androgynous vocal. Have you heard it yet? 
I'll send it. Yeah, to no, I love it. I love all of your stuff with Post-it, yeah. That's like a huge compliment, seriously. Yeah, You're it's like, very versatile and like I said, very layered, which I like. There's like, there's so many elements. Honestly, Rich. real talk, it's, it's easy to get overwhelmed sometimes when there's so many elements, but this wrote itself, I don't know, I felt like there was something that shifted in me. Like, I think it was just part of that evolution of like, I need to show up, I need to start challenging myself to do new things like the show. And then I felt that energy also apply to music. Okay, like, why don't I try something different? Like, why don't I try to add an extra layer here? Or let me like send it to a friend and get some feedback. So I just want to be open and and grow. And I think that growth is starting to uh, show up in the, in the track. So that's a huge, huge deal to hear that from you. Thank you. Oh, of course. And I look forward to, uh, you know, watching your progress and your, your evolution. Thank you. Thank you, Wes. Thanks, Kelly. Hit me up anytime, okay? Okay. Cool. Same here. Ciao. Bye. You're watching The Kelly Mo Show.